Fantastic. Well, in that case, uh, I'll welcome everyone. Um, people are still dropping in, but we want as much time as possible for, for Robin and Vince. That's why we're all here. But anyways, just welcome everyone that's participating. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we have Mr. Robin Sommer and, and Vince Stoffer with us today. And you're in very safe hands. They will take care of business. Um, just wanted to introduce these guys. Vincent has been a cybersecurity engineer as well as a network operations manager uh, at the Berkeley Lab in California. And today he's the senior director of product manage management in, in Corelight. And in essence, this means that Vince is the person that makes sure that Corelight's technical teams develop what the customer needs. And he will be speaking about some of the new features that are coming out of the Corelight Lab today. And Robin also has connections to Berkeley, actually. He has been a senior researcher at something that is called the ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute. And he has been involved with SEEK since the early 2000s. Uh, and a number of capabilities made it into open source distribution, thanks to Mr. Robin. So in 2013, he built upon his SEEK knowledge and co-founded Corelight. And today, Robin and Vince, they will speak about kind of the so what of Corelight. They will be getting into why it makes sense to package Seek and Suricata like this, and also what the future of detection, response, and threat hunting holds. And at Mnemonic, uh, we're heavily invested into Corelight. Uh, we have many shared perspectives on security and our approaches, they mesh really well. And today we offer Corelight as a fully managed service to several of our MDR customers. And we integrated it with our Argus uh, ecosystem and can provide threat intelligence, signatures, and additional analysis on top of the actual core platform. Uh, but this couldn't have been possible without the, the partnership with Corelight. So thank you very much, guys. And thank you so much for being here. Um, before I let Robin take the stage, I just wanted to say that if you have any questions, use the Q&A button and we will answer those questions with the minutes that we have left at the very end. Uh, but with that, uh, warm welcome to uh, Mr. Robin Sommer. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thanks for having us. So it's pretty exciting to uh, be able to speak here today. Uh, let me share my screen and hope that that works. All right. I hope you guys are seeing my slides at this point. Um, yeah, so I'm Robin Sommer. Um, and um, one of the co-founders of, of Corelight, um, also these days, actually primarily the open source lead. A little bit back to the roots for me there. Um, I'll talk more about that. And um, Vince will talk later about, actually more about the our products, like the, the pretty cool functionality we have been building um, out over time into, into our products, also some of the stuff that is um, going to come up. Um, what I figured I'd do is I'll start a, with a little bit of history, uh, how Corelight actually came about and um, and um, from the from the Zeek perspective, how that evolved over uh, a pretty long time at this point um, into um, a widely used system that um, then did indeed lead to Corelight. So um, I wanted to say a little bit about me, but we already had the nice introduction, so there's not much uh, to add there to my to my uh, um, um, the, the places I've been at. Maybe so. Originally, I'm from Germany. I'm now back in Germany, so which uh, makes this time uh, more convenient for me than for Vince, uh, who's in, in the Bay Area. Um, so, but but in between, I, I spent almost 15 years uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area as well, and that is where a lot of the the work on Zeek um, that I, I was part of happened. And there was indeed the, the International Computer Science Institute and, and Berkeley that were I met once for the first time. Um, so, so maybe just to, to set the stage a little bit. So Corelight is um, really um, basically focusing on providing network evidence um, to, to people so that, that in the end, we want, we want you to see what's going on in your network. And we want you to be able to, to track down if there's something there that, that shouldn't be possible. So we're really focusing on, on network traffic analysis for, for threat hunting, incident response, uh, forensics analysis, and um, that all from, a, from an open perspective, which, which means both from um, giving you the data that you need, making as much of the data that, that, that we infer from your network with our products available to you, but also using open components in that software. 
Um, so we originally found it in, in 2013. It, it um, took a little bit to actually gain traction. So it gets, got, got more interesting in 2016, 2017. We're now headquartered in uh, San Francisco. Um, originally, we, we set up a um, stage in Berkeley, just across the bay over there. Um, we have an engineering office in Columbus, uh, Santa Clara as well, and we have an international office uh, in, in London, UK. Our customers are really, um, to a large degree, uh, pretty uh, large places, I would say. So it's the Fortune 50s, it's uh, critical infrastructure, it's government agencies. Um, so basically, people with a lot of network traffic and um, a lot of very sensitive assets to protect. Um, we had our fourth round of funding at this point, um, closed the Series D last year and, and a bit more than, than 200 employees. And actually, I checked this morning. We have At the moment, we have 23 openings on our career page. So we are, we are actively growing at this point. Um, at the heart of our products is, uh, has always been and still is Zeek, the, the open source network security monitoring tool. And that is something that um, the co-founders of, of Corelight, so me and, 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 and Bern Paxson and Seth Hall primarily, um, have been working on for a long time. And then the open source software is, is um, still, um, um, still out there, still alive. You go to uh, Zeek.org, you will sign this, this homepage there. And there's a lot of active development there. So what is what is Zeek um, as a as a project? I want to say a little bit of like, like just a bit of technical background here for for those interested, so that that you guys know what what's really the the driver inside our core light sensors. Um, so Zeek is is open source BSD licensed. It's this. It's in the end, it's a platform for doing network traffic analysis. And and what that means is it's that it's programmable. So it, it at the lower layer, the event engine is something which takes the networks essentially off your network. Uh, sorry, the packets off your network, and and really digs deep into there and, and sees what's going on. I mean, it looks at I don't know lots of protocols. I mean the the, the HTTP and 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 uh, FTP and um, everything you can imagine at least if we have a parser for it. So it tells you in the end, basically, it gets the key uh, steps of activity out of the network traffic. So there was an HTTP request, or there was an HTTP response, and this is what the server replied. Um, and what it does is it feeds it feeds a scripting language. And in the scripting language, it's a little bit like a domain-specific Python. Um, you you can write your own code if you want, or you just get a bunch of like like content that is already out there implementing various um, functionality. Uh, just logging is something you get out of the box with Zeek, um, and then intrusion detection, file analysis, um, all kinds of things that that people have written scripts for at this point. Um, there's a package manager out there that you can just kind of um, do zkg install. That's our little. Um, local client tool for that and you get this this content and you will see later that that quality actually on there on the on our appliances um, have added a bunch of um, this kind of content on top of the core Zeek platform that is really part of our our commercial offering um, just to give you an impression of of, of um, who's using Zeek at this point so Zeek is Basically, this is a list of, of logos of places that for one reason or the other are unknown to run Zeek. Basically, it's public information that they are running it. Um, it's, it, to be clear, it's not core light customers. Um, those, a few of, of them are on there as well, but, but, but this is basically from public sources uh, showing you um, significant Zeek shops um, um, all over. So maybe a little bit of history, and and I think it's an, kind of an interesting um, route that that Zeke took over a while. So 1995 is actually when when Ron Paxson wrote the first line of code. So he came up with a basic approach at that point, and and he published a paper. And and Vern, being Vern, he uh, won the best paper award at Eustic Security with this paper. And then for a long time, not much happened actually in the Zeke space. So um, you see 2006, this photo in the in the middle, that is essentially the Zeke community about 10 years later, um, like 10 people around the table. You see you're, you're truly actually uh, sitting there as well, um, but it was not really many people. And then 10 years, another 10 years later, um, we were at the point where we already had a um, large conference. So we had so this, this photo is about 200 people in at the supercomputer center in, in Austin, Texas. So something happened like um, in, in, the, in this in the second decade, decade, and, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about what that is. Uh, most recently, I mean, due to the pandemic, our events have turned, uh, of course, virtual at this point, but most recently, um, last year, we had uh, 1,600 people watching remotely um, at what is now called Zeek Week. Um, Brocon used to be the original name, Maybe I should, by the way, I should say it. Um, so the original name of Zeek was Bro. So you'll kind of see that name 
uh, popping up a few times, we renamed it at some point into Zeek. So if you hear Pro and Zeek, that's the same thing. Um, so now our event now is called uh, Zeek Week. Um, so what happened, like in that in that in that in that time frame? So you know, let me drill down a little bit here, and that is so. So it's, it's interesting to to realize that the original versions of Zeek Pro at that time. Um, came out an operational need at Lawrence Berch, Berkeley National Lab. Um, that is, that is, a BNL, uh, more bitter context, is a, is a, um, a national lab uh, by the Department of Energy. So it's, they're doing open science, they have open networks, um, but a lot of traffic, a lot of users uh, from all over the world, and they lacked visibility in, in what people were doing. So that was when, when Vern actually set out to start this, out of an operational need by the security at the lab. Um, Ron then moved over to, to ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute, and that is um, where I uh, joined originally. I, I started working um, a couple of summers there as an intern, and then in 2005, I, I moved out into the Bay Area. And what, what Zeke allowed us is to um, actually do academic research. ICSI is an academic research institute, institute and, and, and we, we, we kept writing papers about new stuff that we developed and, and used uh, for network monitoring and analysis, um, particularly in terms of scale and high performance. And then we're able to put into Zeek as our research platform. And, and uh, because we had users um, of Zeek already, so these uh, LBNL and, and, and a few other uh, larger universities and, and, and science labs, um, we got this feedback immediately if whatever we wrote, uh, developed there on the academic side would actually work. So that, that fed into something which in the end led to a pretty powerful system. And it was really crucial to, um, to have this feedback between academic research and operational deployment, something which on the academic side, unfortunately, you don't, don't have that often. So that was a pretty unique opportunity for um, developing this, this technology. This went so well that, that um, around 2010, um, Zeek was pretty widely used among like US universities, US uh, science labs, and the National Science Foundation noticed that is the, the main funding agency um, for science in the US, academic uh, science in the US. And um, they uh, gave us um, a, a series of, of a few grants that for the first time allowed us to actually uh, step out of academic research into software development on Zeek. Um, and um, that allowed us to, I don't know, hire, hire programmers, right? And, and, and not just <laughs> depend on grad students, hire programmers, work on the documentation, fix bugs. So we were really able to turn this into a production system um, that then um, got more and more traction across the US educational space. And um, at the end of this phase, I, I heard from uh, multiple times from people that basically it's, it's that there are hardly any university anymore in their, in their um, 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 community that, that, that wasn't using it. Um, NSF actually um, was pretty uh, happy about this, this, this outcome and, and the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, how it has dist had distributed across the, the university and science space so that they actually started highlighting this um, to the US Congress. This was it's just kind of a side note, but I think it's a, it's a pretty cool anecdote. Um, so NSF needs to go to the US, US as, a, as, a, as a government funded organization. And so they need to go to Congress every year to request their budget for the next year. And when they do that, um, they, they, they always show like, a, like half a dozen of examples from the previous year um, um, as to, to demonstrate their track record, something that was really successful in that year. And um, I guess you can, can see where this is going. In 2017, they actually included Zeek in their, in their budget request. So, and, and the way how Zeek had helped um, protect supercomputers that NSF also was funding. So this was good validation, of course, for the work we were doing there. Uh, personally, what I like most about this is that in 2017, that was also the year, um, or the previous year actually, was when the gravitational waves were recorded for the first time by, by, by LIGO. Uh, so this major like breakthrough, of course, there. And uh, it was nice to see that NSF mentioned Zeek first in their report to Congress. Anyways, so that is um, what, what actually happened here in the end was that, um, we got quite a bit of demand um, towards these final years of this period from, from non-educational institutions. So this is where when the enterprise space got really interested in, in Zeek. Um, companies, government agencies, and they kept approaching us. And there was something that from our, um, our little research group at ICSI, uh, we could really not, not, not realistically satisfy anymore. And this is how cool it started. So basically we started with, um, with contract work and then pretty quickly realized that what we need to build is essentially a, a, a Zeek in a box. 
or at that time a bra in a box. And our first product was indeed that. Bra box one was our first product name. That was when we didn't have uh, <laughs> people yet who, who know how to do how to name things. Um, and this is actually the, one of the first prototypes of our uh, very first product indeed uh, in my office. Um, you see the, at that time, <laughs> still kind of minimalistic user interface. It was a cursus interface. Um, but it already, it was a, a finely tuned stack inside this, this one new server um, that run a highly optimized Zeek and it was really like the, and an FPGA based NIC in there and uh, produced a stream of log files coming out of Zeek um, that were giving you the visibility into your network to see what's going on there. And, and, and Vince has a few examples of what, what, what that means more concretely and, and, and you'll see that. But this was the, indeed the first um, uh, start of um, the Qualy product line. Um, when we got our Series A in uh, 2017, we were nine, uh, sorry, seven people. You see four of them here. Um, Greg, our founding CEO, is also Siemens. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you see at that time, that was actually just after the, the Series A, you see our uh, marketing department, our customer success department, our sales department at the beginnings of our product department, I guess. So this were the early beginnings. And then um, two, two, three years later, fast forward, um, it looked, things looked very different. So, so we had, um, this was the last time before the pandemic that we could actually get the, the, the company together. We were 150 people at that point. And we had just moved into our third uh, set of offices. Um, so that's San Francisco headquarters. Actually, <laughs> the offices still look like that because of the pandemic, um, pretty empty at this point. Um, but we had really uh, turned into a real company with, um, um, a, a solid product line. And this is what basically that, that first sensor turned into um, as, uh, as, as, as a range of products that we had have at this point from um, the smallest for, for, for small environment, uh, medium size, large size, virtual, a fleet manager that, that allows you to um, centrally manage uh, a bunch of these sensors. And then uh, more and more now the, the quality content collection that, that what I showed on my earlier slide with Zeek put really like additional analysis capabilities on top of that, that, that Zeek at the core of the system. Um, and, and, and we have really always been and, and, and really more and more even emphasized um, the open aspect of, of what we're building here. So, so Ricardo is another part now, of course, of, of the Qualite sensor. So when you, when you go with the, with the Qualite uh, product line, you get both of the major open source uh, network analysis tools. Um, we added Smart PCAP um, um, to give you access to, to uh, packets that, that flow through your system. Um, and we continue to invest into open source Seek as well. So we have a dedicated uh, team of developers just for open source Seek. So that's the one I'm, I'm leading these days. Um, and we uh, um, are the ones essentially driving that open source project uh, more than ever, I would say. I mean, we never had so many resources as we have at this point for open source. And one of the new projects, for example, I don't have much time, I don't really have time to, to talk about this today, um, but, but it's, it's a new parser generator, which makes it much easier to support uh, new protocols in Zeek, uh, even if you're not um, familiar with C++ as you needed to be in the past. So with this, I actually, um, I'm happy to hand over to Vince, who can uh, tell you much more about like, like a bunch of cool features that, that our uh, sensor line provides at this point. Great. Thank you, Robin. Let me see if I can get some slides up for you all. Okay, so it looks like now are you seeing just the slide? Yes. Yes. All right, looks good. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, nice to be able to talk to you today and thanks Robin uh, for the, the great intro and the history. Um, a little bit about Zeek and, and what brought us to Corelight. I'm, I'm going to dig in a little bit more um, talk specifically about some of our content, uh, which is primarily what I work on, um, but also tell you a little bit more just about where we think we fit into the space and how the concept of what we call open NDR uh, is really 
relevant to you know the security industry and to uh, you know much of what you are probably doing in your jobs and and how we can help do that a little better. So we'll talk a little bit about our platform, our labs team, which is our research team, um, a, a bit about our content collections and the Suricata rules that we have on our platform, um, a little bit about how we develop those, uh, and then if we have time, I can I can touch on a, a, a new SaaS service that we're going to be offering soon called Investigator and. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little time for questions as well. Uh, so uh, you, had a, you heard an intro of me. I just wanted to say maybe one or two other things and that I, I spent the whole first part of my career as you know an operation security and network engineer, analyst, uh, manager. So I was really doing networking and security uh, versus working at a company, right? So I started in higher education at a, a small college in, in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, and then went to Berkeley Lab, where I met Robin and the rest of the founders of Corelight. Uh, and I have the light bulb there because that was really my aha moment, right? Where I had gone from using a lot of the traditional network tools at that point, um, you know, TCP dump and full PCAP in, uh, you know, Wireshark and Ethereal, these other tools that were available then, uh, and had started to get pretty deep into Snort, uh, which, as you know, is the open source product that, you know, eventually Suricata kind of spun out of. Um, those tools were great and they allowed me to do a, a ton of amazing security response and, and even kind of proactively uh, find things in the network by using uh, you know raw packets. Uh, but as soon as I saw Bro at that point or Zeke, uh, I, I, my, my life was kind of transformed, right? Uh, it, it was amazing to be dropped into the team that had worked with Zeke from the beginning, uh, but it was more amazing to, to be able to see and use that tool for what it for what it was, right? And and Robin described kind of the basics of Zeek, but if you've never used it, uh, maybe the most uh, notable thing that comes out of Zeek is just these protocol logs, right? These logs uh, um, oriented, oriented around individual protocols coming out of the analyzers that Robin mentioned. Uh, and, and what's so powerful um, about these logs and this data is that it's policy neutral, right? So the, the separation of, of data, the raw data and policy, whether it's good or bad or what you should do with it has always been a fundamental uh, tenant of Zeek. Uh, and, and so that means that essentially you capture as much data as you can and you store it as long as you want. Uh, and, and that leads to an amazing power to be able to, to go back in time and analyze historical data for something that you might not know uh, you needed to look at. And it also gives uh, an amazing way to, to think about and create new data and do essentially what is you know called threat hunting now, um, to be able to go into the data, look for anomalies, uh, or uh, you know just take a journey with, with starting with some sort of thesis or uh, question or uh, in investigation and, and go deep into that data and find out everything you can in your network. So I, I, we like to say at Berkeley Lab that it, it you know, Zeke, it wasn't about what Zeke could do. Zeke could basically do anything. You just needed to think about what the question was that you wanted to answer. And sometimes that was the hardest part. Uh, so we had an amazing, uh, you know, entire security infrastructure built around Zeek at the core at Berkeley Lab. And, and it's, I, I used to go and talk and give hour long presentations just about how we did uh, a, a lot of the infrastructure there to do active blocking and our response and everything else. But uh, suffice it to say, that was my aha moment to come to Zeek and the power of Zeek. Uh, and so when the opportunity came up to join Corelight a few years later uh, at the beginning, it was, uh, you know, uh, an easy decision for me to move into this uh, startup world, uh, which has been a very different and interesting experience. But uh, like you heard, I'm now on the product team. Uh, so that means I help uh, coordinate between our customers and engineering and our labs research department to, to get our products out there uh, into the world and, and make sure that they're the best that our customers want them to be. Uh, and I'm primarily focused on the work for the labs team for our research team that Vern leads. So I'll, I'll be talking quite a bit about the content uh, that we have there and, and how we create it and, and what it looks like. <clears throat> Before I do that though, let's let's set the stage a little more on the on the kind of highest level of, of what we do and what NDR is. And, and so here's a slide talking about how we see ourselves in uh, in this market, right? Which is if you look at the SOC triad that has kind of network data endpoint data and then a sim and uh, or a place to collect that data and work with it this is really the the sock triad you could think of crowdstrike as one of the most powerful forces on the edr side uh, 
Uh, and, you know, we really like to think of ourselves as that sort of powerful force on the network side, right? We're, we're combining analytics, we're combining this raw, powerful data uh, and these open source engines that are uh, really the, the key to uh, effective network defense and effective network investigation uh, and, and trying to provide uh, the, the best, most powerful and open data we can. Uh, CrowdStrike isn't on here just because they're a big name in the industry. Uh, I, I wanted to mention a couple things because we have a whole bunch of touch points with CrowdStrike. Perhaps the most interesting is we just closed our Series D funding uh, in the last few months uh, and CrowdStrike actually uh, decided to invest in Corelight. So they have uh, what's called their Falcon Fund, which has primarily been used to invest into kind of technical uh, integrations and companies in their technical ecosystem. But this was uh, kind of the first of an ongoing series of strategic investments that they're hoping to make in you know, companies that are uh, like-minded uh, and working in the space to advance you know, the idea of XDR, to ad advance the idea of uh, you know, this powerful triad of uh, response and investigation. So we have a bunch of technical integrations with, course, with CrowdStrike where we can take their data, they, we can send our data into, into their platforms. Um, but, it, but I think it's most interesting just because we really have alignment with them on uh, where the industry is going and how the power of data is uh, super important to be able to, uh, to do our jobs effectively. So what does that mean at a, a little more granular level? Uh, what is open NDR for us? And, and it's a number of things. Uh, you know, it encompasses, I'd say, uh, alerts and insights. So things that we are detecting uh, or presenting as kind of uh, inferences is something we, as a term we like to use a lot. So this is uh, beyond just data, right? I, I like to think of it as you have kind of raw packets at the bottom of the network stack, and then we have data, which is kind of the events and logs that Zeke and Suricata and some of our other engines can create. Uh, and then above that, we have kind of alerts or inferences. And that's that's something like uh, a Suricata alert going off saying, I've detected something on the network. Uh, it's also uh, a set of inferences in some of our logs where we take particular behavioral activities and identify those in the logs, saying something like, well, this appears to be an SSH connection where uh, a file is being transferred, for example. Uh, and so maybe to, 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 as you see in the orange text, something would be like, uh, you know, for the sunburst or solar winds attack that happened last year, uh, you know, uh, widely publicized and, and really important and, you know, network centric in the fact that we were able to really track down uh, specific ways that, uh, you know, uh, solar winds is being used. And so having a set of rules to detect particular attack types uh, or indicators is something that would fall into this first category. The second category is really the, the raw data, the Zeek logs uh, and some of the other metadata that could potentially come out of Suricata or other parts of the platform uh, to be able to accelerate the incident response, to be able to do that threat hunting. And so this is a, another example where something like, you know, the SolarWinds attack, uh, you know, log for shell as another m even more timely example, right? We can go into these logs because of that policy neutrality uh, and go back and look for specific indicators, uh, look for attacks, look for behavioral characteristics in the traffic, even if we don't have an alert. Uh, and that is just so powerful because if you have a rule for a particular attack, you can detect it, hopefully over and over and over again. That rule may need to evolve or change over time, uh, but you're going to have a detection, whether it's a signature or some sort of other technique to do, uh, and you're going to alert on that. But what if you don't have that created? What if you have already had an attack and you're trying to piece together what happened uh, and all you have is a set of data? Well, the data you would want is the data coming out of Corelight or Zeek, uh, because I can go back now and look at all the different network connections, all the protocols that were being used, and at least get an idea of uh, what some of those characteristics or behavior of the of the network connections were during that attack, even if I don't have a particular signature or alert to be able to identify uh, that attack outright. And so that's just, it's, it's hugely powerful, not just for uh, investigation and uh, IR purposes, but really for, for threat hunting and for proactively being able to uh, discover what's on your network and, and even go back in time for uh, you know, historical um, discovery of, of new threats before they've even been uh, detected. So it's, it's extremely powerful. Maybe the, the last piece to that is just validation of that. And that comes down to raw packets. So as Robin mentioned, we have a new part of our platform that is called Smart PCAP. 
and I won't dive too much into it, but just to say that the, the PCAP market is, uh, I think, old and rather outdated in its approach usually to security. So we try to take a slightly different approach with our smart PCAP product. Uh, it, it uses Zeek as its engine to be able to essentially write out a per connection PCAP uh, so that when you're looking at all of our interlinked metadata uh, in your SIM or whatever analysis tool you're, you're using, uh, you can click a particular link or a set of connections, a single connection link or a set of connections, uh, and pull those right into your analyst workstation and open up Wireshark. So it's no longer looking at a giant bucket of packets and then searching to find them. You already have this uh, amazing index in the Core Light connection logs uh, to be able to, to, to go back and reference exactly the PCAP that, that is relevant for your investigation and pull that up directly. So that along with some other interesting kind of triggers and the way that we save space, the idea is really keep the, the packets that are really important for validation and for things that you would want to investigate and throw all the rest away, right? If, if 80 or 90% of the traffic you're seeing on the network is encrypted, we provide some pretty amazing uh, uh, analytics and detections uh, and inferences for encrypted traffic, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but you don't need to keep those raw packets. There's really nothing uh, beyond that kind of, uh, you know, analysis that you can do with something like Corelight uh, to be able to keep that traffic, right? So throw that away, keep the stuff that you really want in your, in your PCAP store for as long as possible. Uh, and during those times when you need to go back to get validation because you don't have an alert or you don't have the logs to be able to um, give you context around what happened for that particular event, then you can go all the way back to the to the packets if you need to. So the idea here is we started with with Zeek, as Robin said, and then we built on top of um, our platform, you know, another set of tools, uh, including Suricata and now Smart PCAP, to really give you the the three pieces that you need for for network uh, investigation and response. So. A, a little more detail on how we do that, and then I'll, I'll talk much more specifically about some of the particular collections uh, and the data that we create. But as part of Suricata, um, that's, you know, the, the uh, perhaps world's best known open source signature detection IDS uh, and can also run an IPS mode. Um, you often uh, people use the Emerging Threats Pro. Uh, or Emerging Threats Open rule feed from Proofpoint. That's one of the most popular uh, rule feeds for Suricata. Tens of thousands of rules of all sorts of different attacks uh, and uh, malicious activity. And so we actually license that from Corelight and provide that to our customers who uh, you know, license Suricata from us. Um, we are able to do perhaps the most interesting thing about the, what we do with Suricata is we use Zeek as the, the common engine to, to do all the data collection, but also as Suricata runs and generates its alerts, we run those back through Zeek as well. Um, that's interesting in a couple ways. The first way is you can connect the network connections together from Suricata with the detection to the context that Zeek's providing with all of that policy neutral data. Uh, so an, an alert pops up that says, hey, it looks like someone is, uh, you know, has clicked a uh, malicious URL and maybe has downloaded some malware. Uh, well, that will connect into the various network connections that Zeek sees for that particular uh, IP address or that particular network connection, and they're interlinked in the data. So it, it's, it cuts down on the analyst's time to be able to just quickly pivot uh, from the alert into the context and the data for that network connection or connections um, to, to have that all together rather than working from one platform and then kind of going back to another. We've, we've managed to weave these together in a really interesting way. Uh, the second part is just having those all on the same box, having the, the ability to have the performance uh, shared between essentially Zeek and Suricata and the power of our hardware platforms, you know, we can run up to a, a hundred gigs on a single one U box. Uh, so, you know, we have everything from that on the highest hardware side to running in a, a simple binary, a, a Linux binary on the software side to be able to run essentially in any deployment scenario uh, and, uh, you know, still generate all of this uh, rich insight. On the Zeek side, uh, it's even more interesting, right? Not only is uh, Zeek capable of sending out this policy neutral data, these, these logs that we were talked about, but uh, as Robin mentioned, it has a complete scripting language inside it. It's called Zeek script, uh, similar to Python, uh, but it's domain specific and able to stitch together the network events that Zeek creates from raw traffic into pretty amazingly powerful uh, detections. 
Uh, and the reason that these are so much more powerful than something like a signature uh, is that they're, they're able to be behavioral. So uh, you, for Suricata, you might say, okay, if I see this IP address, generate an alert. Or if I see this particular piece of binary code inside a packet, generate an alert, right? This is kind of a typical way a signature might work. Super effective, and for a set of threats, that's exactly what you want to have. Um, Zeek can go to the next level, though. If you could say, well, I want to I want to generate an alert only if I see a, a connection from an external IP address coming into my network, and it has to touch, you know, at least four internal hosts using this particular protocol or this particular set of, uh, you know, uh, connect uh, behavior in terms of its connectivity. And this could be over any number of protocols that that Zeek is able to um, identify and analyze. So you can now go from just matching essentially something to kind of thinking in a programmatic way to say, hey, how could I introduce logic? And since you have a full programming language, you can do things like read from external uh, data sources or keep state on a particular set of connections uh, or keep state on a particular set of data around a single connection. All of that can then be built into creating these very powerful and durable behavioral connections, which oftentimes if we if we get a Zeek uh, package or uh, um, script written, um, that, that will allow us to identify malicious activity um, or malware in a way that is, uh, you know, much more durable. As I said, you can continue to use this signature even as the behavior changes or as the particular, you know, bits and bytes might change, the behavior most likely stays the same. Uh, and so we're able to still continue uh, detecting and, um, you know, alerting on threats that other tools might uh, have dropped off because, you know, a particular IP address changed they no longer have an alert, but the behavior hasn't changed, so we're still able to alert on it. So I'll talk a bit more about some of the way, uh, or some of the particular collections we have in the CoreLight product to do those alerting. Um, and we'll, we'll also touch on um, a, a bit about how we create those and, and what that looks like in our uh, kind of test environment. So here's a high level view of, of where CoreLight fits in. You, you heard from Robin, but uh, you know, it's worth saying again, we take packets off of the wire. We need to have raw packets as input. And whether that comes from an optical tap or a span port, um, or it comes from the cloud, uh, you know, several of the cloud providers have, uh, you know, either raw packet uh, mirrors or a way to, uh, you know, copy traffic from the virtual network cards into uh, another um, VPC. And so there's, there's various ways to capture the traffic um, as well as agents. So, uh, you know, we can take the, the traffic from almost anywhere, run it through the sensor in whatever form factor and outcome, uh, you know, the outputs of the Zeek logs, uh, the alerts that we're talking about that can include Suricata and CoreLight's uh, Zeek alerts, and then extracted files because we, uh, Zeek is also, and CoreLight is extremely effective at carving files from the network. Uh, so anything that uh, we can analyze with Zeek uh, that is showing files will not only provide all the file information like the, you know, hashes, the, the SHA-1, the MD5, the SHA-256, whatever you'd like, uh, the name of the file, who transferred the file, how big it was, all of this sort of metadata that would normally come with every file, we can also then just say, I would also like to extract that file and write it off to disk or write it off to a file store somewhere. So with the combination of all of that, uh, you can see how by still taking a very small subset of the network data, you're able to capture a, an amazing amount of what you need for response and keep that for a long period of time. So I'll touch on the logs just briefly. If, if you've never worked with Zeek or if you haven't seen this, this is kind of uh, an example of not what the logs look like, but what is in the logs. So this is a representation of the fields uh, and the values within those logs. Uh, and so you can see at just at the, at the highest level, right, we have the various protocol logs across the top, HTTP, DNS. The connection log is kind of the uh, global index or reference for every network connection. And so uh, at, at the very least, you'll have a connection log for pretty much every network connection ever. Uh, if it doesn't touch one of the other protocols that Zeke's analyzing, you, that, that might be all you have. Um, but if it does, if it does touch uh, an additional um, analyzer or set of analyzers, then you'll get additional logs created 
uh, that are linked together uh, with a, a unique connection, a unique ID, uh, and, and you're able to pivot between those various data types using that UID, which is extremely powerful. And I'll show you kind of an example of what that looks like here. So Zeek's DNS analysis is uh, really second to none. So we provide uh, the DNS log coming out of Corelight and out of, uh, out of from Zeek is, is amazingly powerful. It provides pretty much everything that you see in the client's uh, request and then everything also received uh, from the response. And so what you see in the, the left-hand column is essentially uh, a, a DNS log where a, you know, a, a host uh, has made a query uh, for this dot pink address that you might see down below, and it's returned a set of answers which are in the red box there. So we've got who made the request, what the request was, and then what the server actually responded with for the answer. So then we pivot into one of those IP addresses to say, okay, let's go see if someone connected to one of those. Well, sure enough, they did. And then we have that UID that's linked to some of the other logs, in this case, an HTTP log and uh, a potentially related SSL log. Uh, so we then can go from a, a DNS request to a client actually talking to one of those servers uh, and then finding out what was actually in that request. For instance, the HTTP, we get the refer and the uh, URI and the user agent. We get all sorts of information, in this case, about the HTTP event. If files are transferred over that HTTP connection, we'd also have another set of logs. We'd have a files log. We might have something else in one of the other logs related to what that file was. So uh, you can see how the, the, the neutrality of getting this level of data for every single connection uh, is amazing. It, it's powerful. Uh, it's a lot of data. <laughs> and so you've got to have a place to put it and store it and search it. And uh, primarily, you know, we work with uh, other SIMs uh, and with, you know, MSSPs and providers who provide those SIMs and uh, that sort of storage uh, to their customers. So it, it's extremely powerful to be able to have all this at your fingertips and do searching uh, for the context of the data, as well as getting the sort of alerts that we're going to talk about. So uh, as I mentioned, a, a set of um, collections are included in our product for Zeek. These are uh, a set of things around uh, command and control, encrypted traffic, uh, a bunch of the stuff coming out of the Z community, which are just kind of miscellaneous. Uh, and then, of course, our customers have the ability to put on their own custom scripts because Zeek is a powerful uh, platform and uh, that scripting language is widely used to be able to create your own signatures and, or not signatures, excuse me, your own behavioral detections with Zeek. Uh, and so those can be loaded as well as on the Suricata side, uh, you can load your own content. We have a set of content included from our own labs team. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So essentially with Corelight, you're getting all this amazing data and you're getting this open, uh, flexible architecture to be able to load in, uh, you know, scripts or detections from the community, both on the Suricata side and on the Zeek side. And so that makes it extremely powerful to be able to leverage that community of, you know, thousands of security uh, analysts and engineers and incident responders out there in the world that are also working with these products. Uh, so we feel like that has not only contributed greatly to the success of our company, but it's also what really sustains and uh, continues to make it uh, the most powerful platform is to, you know, have an open engine or two at the core of our product uh, to be able to create our own IP on top of that in terms of these, some of the detections I'm going to talk to you about, but also then to allow uh, the community to, uh, you know, to pull in detections from the community, which, uh, you know, may or may not be core like customers, but they use Zeek, they use Suricata, uh, and so we're able to leverage, uh, you know, anything in that community on, on your own, on your own box. So I just wanted to touch on briefly our, our labs team. This is uh, Vern Paxson, our co-founder and creator of Zeek, and uh, he leads the research team. They're doing an amazing amount of really interesting work. They are really focused on, uh, you know, ad advanced detection for anything they can do on the network side. Uh, that includes what we call rapid response, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, but maybe the most recent example was the log for shell stuff, right? So. Uh, we uh, immediately responded to that vulnerability. We, we looked at how we could detect this on the network. We found multiple ways to do it. Uh, we wrote a series of blog posts, which are really fantastic. The, the blog on the Corelight site is often featuring really interesting research content. Uh, and this is nitty gritty stuff about, you know, how Zeek or Suricata is being used to detect uh, these advanced threats. And 
uh, how we went about doing it. I think we're very open in describing exactly how we went through the process of creating these detections and how they work. Uh, and so this, you know, we, we oftentimes are releasing these into the open source community as well, right? Not only do Corelight customers get the benefit of the labs teamwork, but we're also oftentimes uh, re releasing these as open source, uh, you know, contributions as well. So the labs team is really focused on creating, uh, you know, detections and new data uh, in, in the form of new logs, new inferences, new insights, whatever. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what they're creating. So we, we started with the core collection uh, and that was essentially the greatest hits uh, for kind of what was in the community, stuff created by us, stuff created by people in the, in the Zeek world. Um, that still continues to grow and there's there's always things changing there. We then added uh, an encrypted traffic collection and I'll, I'll touch on a few components of that, but this is really a fantastic set of things around encrypted traffic analysis. Uh, no decryption required, no man in the middle, no break and inspect. We understand that many of our customers can't do that. That's just not an option. Uh, you know, we serve large uh, governments, we serve large corporations. And uh, while sometimes, you know, that's an option for uh, you know, certain internal services, certainly having visibility into all the encrypted traffic on your network is something that you still want. Uh, and we can provide a, a ton of valuable data there without doing any sort of, uh, you know, beyond just inspection of the encrypted traffic. Uh, then our latest collection was around command and control. So we have 50 new detections and new data um, pieces uh, around C2. And so I'll talk about that. Um, I'll start with that maybe and just say, uh, here's an example of kind of what one of these collections looks like. It's a series of packages or uh, features in the product, and you you just go and turn these on and configure them in the product. It's as simple as that. Uh, and you know th these work in a variety of different ways, but some of the some of the things we went after were um, you know 14 common families of malware that use HTTP. And uh, you may think, well, HTTP is being used less and less, right? Isn't this stuff all encrypted? And yeah, most of it is encrypted, uh, but the fact is that, you know, some of the most prevalent families of, of, of malware and attack tools being used, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, Cobalt Strike or, uh, you know, Meterpreter, these things are using HTTP because it often goes uh, through networks uh, with less detection and less inspection. And so they'll use HTTP for the, the bulk of the transfer, and then they'll use an encrypted payload or encrypted channel inside of that HTTP connection. Uh, so not using TLS, but using something uh, you know proprietary inside there and so we're, we're able to actually do a tremendous amount of analysis and detection based upon the fact that HTTP is still being widely used for these command and control channels. Uh, we went after DNS and ICMP tunneling in some interesting ways we have kind of specific and generic detection so we look for some of the most well-known tools we identify those uh, with just simple alerts hey it looks like someone is using uh, you know, ICMP shell on your network, and it's this IP address, uh, to a more generic or behavioral approach, like I described before, for identifying how some of those uh, tools might be used that are unknown. Uh, so we really try to go after high value, low false positive types of detections, and then also give you the ability to kind of go into a bit of the unknown, into, well, let's, let's use some of these techniques for generic detection to see if we can find what the next thing is. Here's an example of one of those alerts, what it looks like. Here's one for TrickBot malware. So it said, you know, this post included the pass, uh, the text OS password. Uh, that's that's a, 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 a tell for TrickBot malware. Uh, and, you know, here's a, a little bit more information, including the post body, which gives you the, uh, you know, server it came from, et cetera. So this is an example of what one of those detections actually looks like in the real world. So onto the encrypted traffic collection, again, a set of really powerful uh, packages or features in our product that you can just turn on. Uh, maybe most interesting is the SSH and RDP components. So as I mentioned, this is a way for us to uh, analyze SSH and RDP connections and provide a whole set of inferences around what happens within those. So I'm talking about how did the actual uh, you know, connection start, how to initiate, what were the authentication mechanism used uh, to the uh, to the session itself, what happened within that session. We can, we can infer just through our analysis whether or not uh, a person is typing over an SSH connection or whether this was a file being transferred. Was it a small file or a large file? Does it appear to be a computer that actually uh, is doing an automated process? Uh, does someone appear to be brute forcing or uh, you know, attacking these servers in a, in a 
uh, you know, using a number of the kind of authentication bypass uh, vulnerabilities that are available. All of these things we can identify uh, and provide, uh, you know, a, a set of data uh, around uh, alerts and essentially new data in the logs. So uh, an amazing set of information around basically uh, two of the most common kind of remote access tools used on networks today. Uh, and just a couple more slides talking a bit more about that, right? Uh, most ransomware breaches start with something like an RDP uh, entrance into a network. And so having the visibility to say, huh, for instance, here's an example of one of our brute force detections. So a particular computer appears to be guessing passwords and then they successfully log in. And so this is kind of a red alert, right? Okay, someone's guessing passwords, no big deal. Maybe it's just someone knocking on the door. Maybe it's one of our vulnerability scanning tools. But now someone's logged in, and that means they tried 936 times on a single IP address, and then they logged in. And so this is an amazingly powerful tool that, again, uses uh, you know both uh, unencrypted and encrypted analysis for RDP uh, to be able to determine this sort of uh, activity. Along the same lines, here's a brand new package that is actually not out yet. It comes out next week, um, but this is one around identifying VPN traffic. So we have uh, a new set of uh, protocol analyzers that just came out. These are actually using that framework that Robin mentioned called SPICY uh, to do a you know, new analysis for the protocols you see down below, IPsec, OpenVPN, et cetera. Uh, and so with those analyzers, that can help us identify up to 350 types of unique VPN providers or types um, on your network. And so this gives an amazing new log, the VPN log, which just basically has all the connection information about everyone using these VPNs in your network and what type of VPN it is. So if you're, you know, if your corporate policy says, you know, Cisco remote access VPNs are allowed and that's it, I think you might be quite surprised when you put a core light box on your on your network to see that maybe there's a dozen or more other types of VPNs being used and maybe they're going over SSL uh, or protocols that, you know, aren't being blocked in your firewall. And so, you, you know, you may have had no idea or may have not had the visibility into this. So this is just an example of the, the sort of groundbreaking research that I think the team is doing to be able to, to look into where are there gaps in visibility, uh, provide new data and analyzers, and then provide kind of a comprehensive log for what that activity might might look like. Moving on to Suricata, um, you know, I mentioned the, the labs team is also creating uh, Corelight specific rules. So we have a set of rules, including things like pingback and print nightmare and some of the rapid response stuff that uh, has been out in the last, uh, you know, few years. Uh, and so we have a set of our own content that we're creating on Suricata. We also, as I mentioned, license the emerging threats rule set, and we have a set of lateral movement rules from a company called Three Corsec that we really like that we've been working with, and we also license that and give that away to all of our Suricata customers. So we, we have a not just completely Zeek focused, right? We we like to use the right tool for the job, and sometimes you know the flexibility and uh, ease of use to write a Suricata rule is the best way to go. You know, we can get a Suricata rule out the same day. Uh, well, in you know the next day or two, while we hone the perf the perfect Zeek script to be able to to you know continue and enhance the detection uh, capabilities for a particular thing. I wanted to mention uh, our our Polaris program, which is a partner program that we have with our research team, where we actually cite core light sensors at some of our. Uh, largest customers or most sophisticated customers, uh, and they allow us to actually test and tune our detections on their networks. So we actually use their real network traffic uh, in a way to be able to, to test and tune our detections. So this, this really goes to how we create our, our, our alerts and our detections. It, it's not enough to just have an idea, test it on your laptop or even in the lab, and then put it out into the world, right? Oftentimes that's not effective in the network world because there's so many things that are edge cases and unknowns, and I've never seen this before, right? And you put it on the real world network, uh, and all of a sudden, all of your assumptions start, uh, you know, getting tested greatly. So having this program really allows us to, to create these sort of detections that I've mentioned. So here, here's an example on the left of just, you know, 10 or 20 uh, new things that we've actually been working on uh, over the last year or two. And these are examples of where we might have an identification of a particular vulnerability that comes out in the news or someone's alerted us to. We go out and work on that detection. Uh, and then we go to our Polaris program and we actually test it in the real world. Have we found any on, uh, you know, on our Polaris sites? Uh, what are they doing? Are they, is it actually working? Is our detection seeing other stuff? Talking to our customers as part of that 
uh, feedback loop and saying, hey, we've got a detection. Is this one, is this legit? Is this really a log for shell infection? Or uh, is this, are you guys testing from this IP address? That sort of thing. So uh, it's amazing to have that sort of power. Um, and it's an important part of how we create detections that are durable, uh, have a low false positive rate and are really super effective. And the last thing I wanna talk about, I know we're almost out of time, um, but just very briefly in like two minutes and then I'll, I'll make sure that we leave a second for questions is uh, our, our new product called Investigator. So as I mentioned, we don't have a UI and that kind of surprises some people, right? Because we are really focused on, um, you know, providing that data that I've mentioned in all of its forms uh, in a scalable and performant way. And so the, the majority of the growth of our company in the early years was really focused around the largest customers who already had a SIM and a workflow uh, and a set of analysis tools that they wanted to use. And they actually didn't want a new UI. Uh, but as we continue to grow and evolve the company and, and, and work down towards other parts of the market, it's important for us to have that sort of UI and that workflow tool. So we, we've been looking at this problem for a number of years. We actually went out and acquired a company called Pattern X last year, and we've been building uh, what their product was into essentially a new SaaS service that has you know, the ability to send all the data from the Corelight sensors up into the SaaS. Uh, it, it collects that data, it aggregates it, uh, provides scoring and uh, uh, you know context for all of those. And then it also has a completely new machine learning detection pipeline. Uh, so the, the Zeek logs are used to feed this pipeline to create a whole new set of detections. Uh, that feeds into a set of workflows and investigatory kind of screens uh, that allows you to do searching, allows you to generate alerts, allows you to export those alerts, et cetera. And so we, we see this as kind of uh, for, for smaller customers, it might be the, the, the single place they go uh, to do their investigation on the network side. For larger customers, it might be some place that they go to fill some of the gaps uh, in their detection uh, and response infrastructure. So sending logs up to Corelight's investigator to get detections back into their existing workflow. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a SaaS platform. It's got this amazing set of machine learning detections that are really in, in Corelight form uh, exposed and open in a way that I think you'd probably never seen uh, in a machine learning platform before. So there's not time to cover this in detail, but I just wanted to give you a hint that, you know, this is something that's coming. And if you're interested, talk more to, to us uh, because it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is the next step of our evolution of going from kind of sensors, being able to generate data into, you know, a, a cloud analysis, storage and searching platform. So we're, we're very excited. Um, so that's all I have for uh, presentation. Let me stop the share and see if there are any questions. You can see my email address down there at the bottom. I'm happy to answer any questions now or offline. Um, let's see if any questions have come up. If well, we not. have two unique questions. Uh, we have four in total, but we don't have too much time. So maybe just answer them quickly and we'll see. Um, sure. But how would you go about finding an unknown threat? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's a great question, right? We talked about the, the power of the Zeek data is really because you're capturing so much information of what's happening on the network, an unknown threat becomes a search for particular characteristics, whether those are indicators, IP addresses, domains, uh, URIs, user agents, uh, hashes in various forms, JA3, uh, you know, encrypted information on the certificate side, the SNIs and the but, you know, all the information included in the certificates, all of that is is captured and detailed in these logs. So when you go after unknown threats, you have the biggest source of information that you could ever imagine on the network side. And, and once you've gone in and done some investigation or some hunting for particular things you're looking for, and you may have found something, okay, I've got it now, then you can go about creating that detection. So you have the, the full loop of being able to find the data you need to create a new detection and then install that detection and find it going forward. That's really great. And one quick fast one at the end then. Um, is a CM necessary to use Corelight or is that just for a smart PCAP? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. 
a sim system like your Splunk. Oh, a sim system. Yeah, yeah gotcha. Okay, yeah. So uh, like I said at the end, like all of our data feeds into a sim or something downstream analytics pipeline of, at this point. So the, the smart PCAP system is connected to the core light sensor. That's where there's, you know, a, a connected storage array. Uh, and then the, the logs themselves contain the link to go back to that storage array, and that would be sent to the sim. So generally you'd be seeing and viewing the core light logs in a sim, uh, and then you'd be clicking there to, to collect uh, the PCAPs and bring them back to your workstation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and everyone, if you have questions after the webinar, feel free to email Vince or, or Robin. Uh, you can also use the market at mnemonic.no and we'll make sure everyone gets back to you. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.